Good morning. This is nice. I can see all you lifelike. <laughs> We're going to start with some prayers. Good morning, everybody. Om organ ugi noob shang sham pema ke sar dam pola ya shen choki noob drune pema shune je su drak kordu kandro mang po. Teacher, though destroyer, and thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who were wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you who is free from dust. 
matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector, endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, feel devotion-like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning, to the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, while abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage. To all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, and all aspects, with supreme faith I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action. Accumulate virtue and goodness. Subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen, and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O my masters, my idams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please set forth ways of your blessings. Idam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam Narati <clears throat> the Heart Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagavan was dwelling on massive vultures mountain on Rajagriha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan is absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, said this to the venerable Shariputra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom 
should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly, beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomena. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to, and including no eye element, and no mental consciousness element. There's no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to, and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana, all the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly, completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of the mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared Kayata Gate Gate Paragate Parasamgate Bodhisoha. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose in that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated, even the Chakatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharivati Putra, the, Bodhis the Mahas Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. Thank you, Susan. Um, I'm going to do a talk today on visualization and vision in the Buddhist path and in general. But before I start talking a lot, let's just do a little exercise. Because we just did the Heart Sutra. No eye, no ear, no nose. And we go through that relatively quickly. So let's just contemplate for a moment no nose. So looks like you're mostly all in a meditative posture, but take a meditative posture if you can. And if you're not driving, lower your gaze slightly and just take a breath or two to get present. And consider for a moment your nose. We all have one. 
or we don't, no nose. The nose, it has a, a bone structure, it comes to a point. Then the bones go back into the forehead. Where exactly does the nose end and the forehead begin? I think about the skin on the side of your nose. It folds over the nose bone and then into the, becomes your cheek. And where does the nose, where's the demarcation between your nose and your cheek? And you have nostrils in your nose. Nostrils or channels go up into your face and your forehead. Are they part of your nose? Where do they end? And their sense organs and sense media. And you might might notice smells. And are, are those part of your nose? Where does that part of your nose begin? Where does it end? The nerve receptors that interpret the sense. Is that nose, not nose? And the little hairs in your nose. Is that nose? Even down to the molecular level. Your nose, flesh, bones, all made up of little molecules. Are they nose or no nose? If we really think about nose, we always think we have one and it's just there. But it, it's really not necessarily clear where nose is and where nose is not. Okay, so thanks. You bring your attention back to your space. And then just ask you to think for yourself, does that make you think of no eye, no ear, no nose any differently? Actually having contemplated it and dwelt in it and maybe tried to look for it in your mind's eye where your nose is. You could put a little comment in the chat if you're by a computer if you want, if that made a difference for you. And we won't read those, but just might be kind of fun for you to share what it was like to really dwell in nose or no nose. Okay, so as I mentioned, I'm gonna do a talk on vision, visualization. And I'll talk about just from a common sense perspective and secular life and some science behind it. And then in uh, sutra and um, our shamatha practice and then uh, the role of vision in tantra. And um, my name's Ellen Wolf. I think from what I can tell, I know you all, so I don't have to introduce myself particularly, but I'm a student here at Lions Road Dharma Center, student of Lama Jimpa. And um, I'll tell you the motivation for my talk is I've always been interested in vision. I've been kind of a goal-oriented person. So if I envision something that I want, then it really compels me to work towards it. And I have believed in that law of attraction. You know, you put out a vision and then it sort of you bring it to yourself and, and things start to happen in that space. I also did once, I think even before I got involved with Lion's Roar, a somatic practice in a leadership workshop where there was a somatic coach that had us do some things where we were envisioning certain energy flows out our body. And I could actually feel stuff in my arm. I could feel the tingling of energy out my fingers. And after that point, I got really interested in the Buddhist path. I thought, whoa, there's way more going on here than I usually figure. And that was interesting to me. So I've kept that in mind. And, um, and I'm interested in Tantra because, well, I heard it's a fast pass to, to, to enlightenment. So that kind of interested me. But I, I always am kind of a, a hindrance because I'd like to understand why it works. You know, I don't just go in with blind faith. I always want to know what's going on. So I've, I'm interested in vision from that perspective. But I'd say what really got me to do this talk was that um, I've had a period in my life for a year or two when it felt like things weren't going so well. And I was kind of in this personal little pity party with all the things that weren't going so well around me. And I remember at least a couple occasions going in to see Lama and saying, you know, I just feel 
kind of blah, like low energy blah. Like I'm, I know I'm doing the right things. I know I'll get through this. And I know if I just keep going, I'll get my head out of the sand, but I just don't feel it. You know, I, I can't really feel that that's going to happen. He'd say, well, you need vision. And, and I'd say, okay, uh, great. That's great. Okay. Yeah. Go me. Um, and then of course, when it came time, Connor said, you ready to do a talk? And I said, no, not now. But I asked Lama what I should talk about and what do you think he suggested that I talk about? Well, vision and visualization. So here I am. Um, but it's really turned out to be a very exciting topic for me to explore and think about. Um, in terms of sources, I watched Lama last week come in with this big stack of books. So I brought some um, Lama Yeshe, Introduction to Tantra. I don't know if you can see these, but I gave my list to Connor. So hopefully we'll post them someplace. Um, the Union of Bliss and Emptiness by the Dalai Lama. Um, I have a very fun book that I'm going to do another little sort of meditation that's inspired out of this book, Circling the Sacred Mountain by Robert Thurman and Tad Wise. If you haven't read it, it's a kind of a nice read. You know, it's not so heavy like some of our Buddha Dharma study program books. And there are a few others, too, that I don't have books for because I have them on Kindle, but I'll try to mention them as we go through. So... Um, so first off, wh what do we mean by vision? I think it's, it's good to sort of sort that out because, um, something Lama says sometimes, we live in an imaginal world. You know, it's all about imagination. So vision is about imagination, um, and sort of navigating the imagination we go through in life that we don't even realize we're doing, and then more intentional imagination. Um, Alexander Berzin wrote a nice article um, on visualization. And one thing that he writes is that visualization is kind of a not a great word for it, because it's really using your mind and your mind's eye and imagination. And so it's more than just visual. Visual is sort of a too narrow description for it. Um, so not only sights, we're working with smells and sounds and physical sensations and emotions. And we do that obviously with our minds. And one of the things it does is it lets us use both sides of our brain. So instead of just a logical brain, we use you know the more emotional, sensual part of our brain. And it brings a lot more of our potential to our practice and our life when we can use both sides of our brain. Um, so just, you know, from a pragmatic perspective, secular even, not even really on the Buddhist path, I guess you can ask, why do we need visualization? You know, why do we need it at all? And there's a psychologist in LA that I've read articles from that I really like. Her name's Regina Pally. And she wrote an article called The Predictive Brain. And um, basically, the, the thesis of it is, is that what we believe is based on our past. So we act in a way that's consistent with our past, which means that if we don't do anything different, then we just keep reenacting re our past. And um, essentially, she writes, we learn from the past what to predict for the future, and then we live the future that we expect. So we keep sort of making the same behavior patterns or mistakes, so to speak, over and over again, if we don't do something different. And that's fine that we live the future based on the past, but how correct is our view of, of what the past has been? How correct is the interpretation? And do we like the way we're interpreting it? If you do, if you like the way your past has been and the way your life is, then you just keep doing the same thing and you'll be fine. But if you want a different future, you have to do something about it to make make a difference. There, there's another author that I, I took from two different books that he wrote. His name's Stephen Levine. Actually, he's not alive anymore. I would say he's more of a, he was kind of a poet and a writer, but, but then a Buddhist as well, but more of a Theravadan practitioner. He was pretty tied in with Spirit Rock, but very poetic. I liked him a lot. And he wrote a book that's kind of another good read, I think, called One Year to Live. And it's essentially about living the next year of your life as if it's the last year of your life. And he's done a lot of work with grieving and dying. And so he's just being thoughtful in that book about it. And one thing that I caught in there when I was getting ready for this talk is he wrote, 
until we stop defining ourselves by our memory, we'll never find out who we really are or who we really aren't. We are awareness itself, not limited to the tiny memories and thought which arise in that vastness. It is our identification with these thought molecules that shrinks our enormity to fit our discontent. It increases our fear of being found unworthy, he writes. So part of the work, I think, is to tap into the vastness and not just relive the tiny little moments that do make up our past. You know, um, visualization, it's not owned by Buddhists, right? It's even something that executives use, high-performance athletes. You know, you hear of the gold medalist envisioning himself crossing the finish line and breaking the world record. So it's something that's used quite heavily. And um, I wanted to show a little video clip. So I'm going to test Connor's skills here. This is a clip, uh, a part of a TED Talk done by a rock climber named Alex Honnold. And he free soloed El Capitan. So for those of you that aren't climbers, it means he climbed El Capitan. And since most of us are from this region, we probably have a visual image of what El Capitan is. It's a climb that takes many climbers days, many, many pitches. And he climbed it by himself with no ropes. And he was the first one, and I think the only one that's done it. So if we can show this clip, he spends a couple minutes talking about his experience. And what I want you to listen for is how he used visualization, the qualities of his visualization. I'd like to show you guys 30 seconds of the best day of my life. This is El Capitan in California's Yosemite National Park. I was climbing by myself without a rope, a style of climbing known as free soloing. This is the culmination of a nearly decade-long dream. And in the video, I'm over 2,500 feet off the ground. Seems scary? Yeah, it is. Today, I'd like to talk about how I was able to feel so comfortable and how I overcame my fear. So I started climbing in a gym when I was around 10 years old, which means that my life has been centered on climbing for more than 20 years. After nearly a decade of climbing mostly indoors, I made the transition to the outdoors and gradually started free soloing. Elcat was always in the back of my mind as the obvious crown jewel of solos. It's the most striking wall in the world. Each year, I'd think, this is the year that I'm going to solo El Cap. And then I would drive into Yosemite, look up at the wall, and think, no freaking way. <laughs> the thing that makes El Cap so intimidating is the sheer scale of the wall. 3,000 feet of climbing represents thousands of distinct hand and foot movements, which is a lot to remember. Many of the moves I knew through sheer repetition. I'd climbed El Cap maybe 50 times over the previous decade with a rope. Once I found sequences that felt secure and repeatable, I had to memorize them. I had to make sure that they were so deeply ingrained within me that there was no possibility of error. Staying calm and performing at your best when you know that any mistake could mean death requires a certain kind of mindset. <laughs> That's not supposed to be funny, but, but it is. It is. <laughs> I worked to cultivate that mindset through visualization, which basically just means imagining the entire experience of soloing the wall. Partially, that was to help me remember all the holds, but mostly, visualization was about feeling the texture of each hold in my hand and imagine the sensation of my leg reaching out and placing my foot just so. I'd imagine it all like a choreographed dance thousands of feet up. The most difficult part of the whole route was called the boulder problem. It was about 2,000 feet off the ground and consisted of the hardest physical moves on the whole route, an edge smaller than the width of a pencil but facing downward that I had to press up into with my thumb. The crux culminated in a karate kick with my left foot over to the inside of an adjacent corner. As I practiced the moves, my visualization turned to the emotional component of a potential solo. Basically, what if I got up there and it was too scary? Doubt is the precursor to fear, and I knew that I couldn't experience my perfect moment if I was afraid. I had to visualize and rehearse enough to remove all doubt. On June 3, 2017, I woke up early, ate my usual breakfast of muesli and fruit, and made it to the base of the wall before sunrise. I knew exactly what to do and how to do it. I had no doubts, I just climbed right through. I rested for a moment below the boulder problem, and then climbed it just as I had practiced so many times with the rope on. My foot shot across to the wall on the left without hesitation, and I knew that I'd done it. With 600 feet to go, I felt like the mountain was offering me a victory lap. I climbed with a smooth precision and enjoyed the sounds of the birds swooping around the cliff. It all felt like a celebration. And then I reached the summit after three hours and 56 minutes of glorious climbing. It was the climb that I wanted, and it felt like mastery.
Am I back live again? Okay, it's blinking. So yeah, pretty cool, huh? So if you listen to what he said about visualization, he said that he imagined the experience that the visualization was about feeling the texture. I mean, so he's not just thinking, okay, I'm made it to the top. He's like picturing actually what the rock would feel like in his fingertips. He said, I imagine the sensation of my leg placing it out and placing, reaching out and placing my foot just so, like a choreographed dance. He said, visualize and rehearse enough to remove all doubt. So I mean, it's pretty sophisticated what he did. And then he made that. It's amazing, I think. So that's just one example of, of people that use visualization to, to make a difference in what they want to accomplish. So let's talk a little bit about efficacy. Why does it work? Some of the science behind it. Um, as Regina Pally said, without being conscious about it, what we're thinking, we're using our past to predict our future. And if we instead put a different future into our mind stream, it can have a different outcome. So how does that work? And so there's been some science around, I'll give you some examples anyway that I'm familiar with, of the way that just our mind is connected to our body. It's connected to our physiological system. It's connected to our neurological system. Um, it alters the way that the, the mind and, and ultimately the body function with different mind stream thoughts. Um, Jerome Gropman's a doctor who himself, he suffered from over a decade of lower back, chronic pain and arthritis type condition. And he got very interested in hope and expectation. And he wrote a book called The Anatomy of Hope, where he looked into this a bit and studied it. And you've probably all heard of endorphins. There are endorphins. There's another hormone called encephalons. And they, they essentially act like morphine to block pain receptors in the body and have the physiological system feel differently. And he looked into studies, and there have actually been even surgeries, like, oh, there's a whole concept of placebos that we're familiar with, probably placebo medicines. But there have also been placebo um, surgery studies done where, for example, uh, a group of folks had arthroscopic surgery on their knee. And one set of clients had surgery as if uh, full-blown regular arthroscopic surgery, but there, another half of the study subjects only had placebo surgery. So they had um, superficial incisions and saline injected into their knee, but otherwise the two sets of subjects were treated the same. They were all treated the same going into the surgery room, talk on the way about how this is going to be so great for them, relieve their discomfort. And then afterwards, even the post-surgery care teams didn't know which group of subjects were which. And in over 80% of those that had the placebo surgery, they reported profound relief of chronic arthritis, restriction of movement and pain in their knee. And this kind of study has been also done on people with low back pain. So people actually, when they believe something to be true, it can change dramatically their experience. I think it's pretty amazing. So, um, and, and there seem to be three major factors. Did they believe that it would be true? What was their expectation about it? And what was their desire? Did they desire to have a different outcome? And those beliefs in their mind stream altered their future. I think pretty cool. Um, there's another thing I think I'll mention because I tend to come from the logical skeptical side. There's, um, there was a logician in the 1600s called Pascal. Maybe some of you have heard of Pascal's wager. Essentially, he was very, he was a atheist, didn't believe in anything, but he got interested about uh, the belief in God and afterlife. And he sort of applied his logic to this. And he basically thought to himself, there are two possibilities. Either there is a God and there is afterlife and there is a heaven and a hell, or there isn't a God and there's no afterlife and it won't matter. And what he realized was, if I believe that there's a God and afterlife and a heaven and a hell, and I act my life accordingly, so I act in a heavenly way as if I want to be in heaven, and it turns out to be true, then that will be really good. And if it turns out to not matter, it won't matter, right? If there's not a God, it won't matter because nothing happens after life anyway. But if I don't believe and I don't act that way and there turns out to be a God in an afterlife and I haven't acted in a heavenly way, then that might not be so good. So he's essentially he's saying, 
like what's the harm you know it could visualization for example could work or could not work and maybe you don't know if it does or not but why not try so that's another reason why i i say go for it a little bit is from a logical pers perspective pascal all right let's talk a little bit about visualization on the buddhist path um, Historically, in the earliest Buddhist literature, the Pali text literature, there was not that much colorfulness, storytelling analogies in the scriptures. It was more sort of plain. But then over time, when Mahayana became more popular, a lot of the colorfulness, storytelling analogies, iconography came into the Buddhist practice. And now we see it throughout, even though it's maybe a little bit more affiliated or associated with Tantra. There still is visualization in all parts of our Buddhist practice today. So even in Sutriana, Sutriana is all about storytelling, examples and analogies and iconography, very rich with storytelling. And it's meant to have our contemplations and our practices be more enlivened and rich. And um, even shamatha practice uses a lot of visualization. and um, especially as we even set up for the shamatha practice. So I wanted to invite you to do another little meditative practice. Uh, Lama talks about this a lot, uh, presencing the refuge field as we get ready to sit in our shamatha practice. So I'm gonna lead you through a little guided meditation that's inspired again by the Circling the Sacred Mountain book. It's quite nice. So um, if you're sitting, standing, and you can Assume an upright but relaxed posture and soften your gaze a bit if you're not driving, for example. So settle in, focus on a few breaths. We calm your mind. I'm going to give you some, invite you to have some visualizations. So just breathe. Count a few inhalations. Once you're calm, begin to visualize. Imagine a field of vision above your forehead, which you see with your mind's eye, your third eye rather than with your normal eyes, kind of space and light, a boundless sky. And in that sky is your greatest mentor, could be Lama, could be the Buddha, could be some great teacher you had in school, could be a parent or a grandparent. Choose him or her to embody the state of being that you aspire to. Enlightenment. The total knowledge of everything worth knowing. Visualize that person present before and above you as a body made of light. Now the being looks at you and you see the face. Hard to visualize whoever it is at first. It might just be a flash because your mind is unsteady. You see that being up there right above you. I'll just use Buddha because that works for me. You see him right here, right now, not dead a thousand years ago. He's happy that you're going to meditate now. He's looking down at you, smiling because you're concentrating on your opening your mind. And from his smile, light rays flow down. Like streams of medicine, they flow into you and make you feel more like light. You begin to feel blissful and buoyant, as though a spotlight is shining on you, lifting you up in this spiritual limelight that makes you glow with bliss. It drives away smoky, dark doubts, negative attitudes, and worry. Visualize that you're being bathed in this radiant aura emanating from a a being of total omniscience. 
takes a lot of imagining. Don't forget to breathe. You must breathe to imagine, at least in the beginning. It's crucial to develop this positive setting before meditating on anything. A luminous setting is key to lifting ourselves out of our habitual, ruminating thoughts. Our sense of the self-identity, our self-world. We need to enter into the space of saints and sages and gods and goddesses and create a new space of possibility for ourselves. We don't just say, well, I'm going to do something, but it's going to be the same me that does it. This goes along with the preposition that after I finish, it will still be the same me who just spent time meditating. Instead, we start by med- start meditating by creating an ideal space. And then we enter that space and everything opens and becomes possible. This is a path of becoming aware of and shifting our sense of orientation, substituting a more positive view. The space where we take refuge when we meditate is known as the refuge field. It's a kind of portable shrine we learn to live with as we make our lives more and more spiritually positive. Now feel the field around you on your level with a great crowd crowd of beings below the illuminous presence. In the front ranks of this crowd are all those we know closely. Our lovers, our mates, our children, looking to us because they sense that we've entered into a different field. We perceive the light that suffuses us from the mentor being as our own new glow. For this reason, they're smiling too. Their pleasure manifests in more light and energy flowing back to us in turn as more empowerment, more energy, and encouragement. From the mentor being to us, to the other beings, back to us, and back to the mentor. A figure eight circuit flows. We sit at the central point of the figure eight. We're not just developing in isolation. We're beginning a conscious evolution in relationship with all those around us. Cultivate this field of bliss, which you have earned through much evolutionary struggle. Sense the incredible preciousness of this accomplishment. Feel pleased with yourself, soberly impressed with what you have achieved. You don't need to adopt a completely different belief system as long as your old one allows you to feel that you are precious. So hold that thought, proud, pleased, happy, and glowing with energy. Okay, thank you. Bring your attention back to your space. It'd be nice, wouldn't it? Start every meditation like that. It's not a lot. It doesn't take a lot. It just takes a moment or two. But it really brings the richness to visualize all that energy and field around us. So Lama leaves a lot, weaves a lot of visualization into his teachings. He says it's a matter of seeing the whole process, a matter of being in the middle and yet seeing the whole thing. I think by that he means a matter of finding the Buddha qualities, but yet navigating normal life, going home, paying the bills, feeding the dog, so forth. He says it means an open-heartedness, meaning manifesting all the Buddha nature. And as Lama suggests, it's taking it's like taking on an imaginative reality. And even in Shamatha practice, when we close, we dedicate the practice to all beings. You know, we send out the light, the energy. So you can see our our Shamatha practice, our Sutriana teachings filled filled with visualization. So I wanted to talk a bit more about Mahayana and into Tantra, but maybe we could stop and see if anybody has any questions or wants to offer anything in discussion before I go on.
I load everybody into such peace and bliss. Can you read that, Connor? Yeah. Uh, Roberta, uh, what recommendations might you have for uh, difficulty visualizing the Buddha as light? Uh, that is, often what visualization, what is visualized in not light, but rather more solid, if that makes any sense? Um, and I don't know. I sometimes when I'm on the hangouts at home i can't hear the questions so i don't know if you could hear the question if you had the chat you can read it but i think roberta is saying how do we get there you know how do we go from you know like I, when i start out i look at the buddha on my the statue on my altar and it is very solid there's no light coming out of it how do we get to that experience of light i don't know i mean i two things come to mind first is just practice right just trying it out, practicing it. What does it feel like? How can we think about it? If we were to pretend light was coming from the heavens into our body through our forehead or our central channel and our crown down into our body, practice. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is there are, of course, meditations online. Uh, there's a recorded that you could listen to. You could try it, maybe get used to it that way. Those are a couple ideas. I don't know if that helps to Roberta. Thanks. She said thanks. Whether it helped or not, she said thanks. Any other questions before we go on? Ellen, this is Susan. You know, visualization, um, I'm wondering, is not just visual, right? I mean, it, it, it encompasses all of the senses. So sometimes when um, I'm thinking light, it's not so much like sunlight as it is that plus warmth plus a lightness i mean as in weightlessness so there's there's it's not just like visual you know the the word itself seems to be a little bit limiting exactly and that's what alex burson was saying was it's not just eyes it's experience you know sometimes you can try to feel the tingliness of the light coming into your body or the openness of the cells or the space in your own body as the light comes through. So I agree. Good point, Susan. Karen. Yeah, um, I just wanted to relate and sort of second that or third that or whatever about the, I found that I have uh, experiences based on what I visualize. So I was in a, having a guided meditation uh, with Venerable Rene, and he was having us imagine that our bodies were just like, you know, like skin with air inside, like a balloon. And then we became these big balloon bodies and we start floating up in the sky. And then all of a sudden he said he took a pin and he pricked it. And I jumped about a foot off the floor when that happened. So it showed that I was so into that visualization, you know, of myself, you know, of course it's not with my eyeballs, but you know, mind's eye visualization of myself and that, and that it was very powerful uh, energy so that when he pricked it, you know, then I, you know, I released a whole bunch of energy. So it's really a very extremely powerful and, and if you listen to some of these teachers, they do have lots and lots, there's lots and lots of things to visualize and visualizing the merit field, like you said, is I think is really important before practice. And I can, and it really makes a difference on how I feel. That's great. Thanks, Karen. No other hands? Okay, let's keep going then. Um, so in Mahayana Tantra, just, a little bit of the comparison of visualization, how it's used in the Buddhist path, is different in the different stages of the path. So in Sutriyana, the, the goal is really cleansing our mind and getting rid of, of faults and limitations and trying to bring in um, more wisdom and compassion. And in mandala work, the point is really to have a, a larger vision and to start losing our solid sense of I-ness, me. And that allows, it enables more easily connection with a guru or a deity. 
And then Tantra is kind of considered, like I said, the fast pass to enlightenment because in Tantra we start to say and act and really manifest the qualities of a Buddha has a, a much more profound impact on one's physiology and mental state. So what is it that we're visualizing in Tantra? And I know a lot of you do have Tantric practices already, and some of you might not, but what is it that we're visualizing? Usually we're visualizing a certain image or deity or yidam, and whoever that is, it's we try to visualize the most highest enlightened version of it that we can render. And usually the deity is like sparkling clean, but has real fancy costume adornments and jewels and might be holding special things in their hands, scepters and so forth. But the idea is to envision them as if they existed in real life. You know, not like they're some two dimensional thing on a tonka, but that they're really there and start experiencing their qualities, their unborn originated qualities. And it, it takes us beyond those limitations. And I talked in the beginning about how if we just live our life forward like we've experienced it in the past, we have all the limitations and already pre-programmed belief structure about who we are. And, and assuming the qualities of the deities breaks us free of those limitations. But it also requires some relaxing of the holding of our of our impression of who we are. And when we use this imagination, we also al allows us to harness a lot more energies. So energies that are inside of us and outside of us and maybe more subtle than we're used to paying attention to. So visualizing the deity brings to surface these divine qualities. It's really what we're after. And they're not divine qualities that are of somebody else. They're really divine qualities that exist in us. And we just don't notice them because we stay in the shroud of our habitual patterns and limitations. So the goal is not to become something different than what we already are. The goal is to connect with those divine qualities in ourselves. So we... We have to remember, as Lama says, we're already living in an imaginal world. You know, some people think Tantra, oh, that's, that's weird. But we're living in an imaginal world every day. It's just we don't realize that we're practicing that way. You know, so this is a chance to practice imagination of a different flavor. It's no more correct or incorrect than the, the life we go around living, not even realizing that we're making it all up. So the problem is, is that we don't realize that what we're imagining on a daily basis isn't real. You know, we're just acting like it's solid and real and how things are. The, the biggest obstacle in our path is our persistent belief in these, with this ordinary life as, as normal. So the tantric technique then lets us identify as we identify ourselves as a deity is in direct opposition to those normal patterns and works to deprogram those patterns. So something amazing, actually it's been good that it's taken me so long since Connor invited me to do this talk, to do this talk, because I've been paying attention to it and then all these things about visualization, like the rock climbers video popped up in my life. Um, so I you know, collected all these bits and pieces from the books and such and wrote it down on my paper. And then on Monday, I'm, I'm taking this class, really cool class called Vajra Yoga through the Tibet House and the, the Menla part of Tibet House. And Robert Thurman is the main Tibetan Buddhist teacher. And on Monday, he talked just on this topic. And it was really fantastic. So Connor's got another video clip and hopefully our streaming will be quick enough that we, you can make it out, but I wanted to share a few minutes of his talk from Monday. Um, because it does sort of, I think they can hear it. Okay. Um, because the video starts very quickly, I'm probably going to get it going and then restart. Let's see you guys. I don't know if you heard that, but bear with us. That's what he said.
to the devil, and then the devil goes home. So, so you have to do that. So tantra, you have to tantra, then becomes a place of accelerating the physical evolution, the whole line of development of the Buddha's body, a body that can be open to all beings, that can explode into a million life forms and open to all beings and serve every being in any form you like. That kind of a body, to develop that, to open the tantra becomes a way of accelerating it. So the same emptiness thing that you're doing in Mahayana, because Vajrayana is Mahayana, but what is the Vajrayana adds is accelerating the compassion development. That's the whole point. And that's the reason to change your body. You know, you, you shift, like right now, if you're a good, healthy person, you have a sense of your body, of having two kidneys, I hope, <laughs> two lungs. Uh, in Tibetan medicine, they call the mother lung and the son lung. A heart, beating heart, a liver, gallbladder, etc. You know, you have all that equipment. You have a feeling of that. Then you have sinews, a nervous system, muscles. You have autonomic nervous system, parasympathetic, sympathetic. You know, you have an image of all of that, especially if you have a little medical training, or you learn that in hatha yoga. So you have an image of yourself. When you do tantra, you you dissolve that image, and you get an image of yourself as made of light with a, ho a hollow hologram, like a hologram, like you're a hologram. You don't bother with organs and things. You just bother with the nervous system, the subtle body, with the chakras, with the, with the like, which is roughly like the, the vagus complex, but it's not the vagus. It's not just the vagus. It's, it's something create. You shape that yourself. So you have to have tremendous visualizational ability. How do you get the visualizational ability? You get it from emptiness. The more you plunge into emptiness, the more you come back into the dreamlike aftermath of emptiness, the more you realize that when you're awake, you're dreaming. And you are shaping the world around you all the time. And then, therefore, you become more in charge of your own imagination. You are not just automatically seeing something the way you're supposed to see it. You're like Emily Dickinson. You see dewdrop on a flower bud. And you see the lanterns on the streets of heaven where the Go back live. This is okay. So sorry we cut him off because he goes into this long diatribe as a as an academic does about Emily Dickinson, but that it's not really the point. The point is his description is just amazing, I think, of how it all comes together. You know, compassion fuels the ability to practice emptiness and realize that our awake life is dreamlike already and then inviting in the deity qualities. Um, but it takes, so we have these sadhanas, they're different yidams and different tantras and, and usually we are attracted to one or the other, but it takes more than just reading the sadhana. It takes going beyond the words a kind of akin to what we did with no knows. You know, if we just rattle through that every day and don't think about it, it doesn't have the same impact. Um, as the Dalai Lama says in the Union of Emptiness, Bliss and Emptiness book, he cautions that mere recitation of the text alone can't bring the result. He says, visualizations are to moisten the mind, but it requires real inspiration, not just mere recitation of words. And that inspiration is believed to require the force of a guru. So really it takes you know, some, some juice and inspiration and energy around it. Or as Shogam Trumpa says in the Tantric Path of Indestructible Wakefulness, he says um, this energy, he says we can describe it another way by saying it's like being a person who is falling in love. When you fall in love, you even lose your sense of possessiveness because you begin to melt like butter on a stove. You don't exist, and that doesn't exist. You just melt. You tingle with pleasure at even the thought of the person you are in love with. And also, he says, the more purified and open your state of being, the more smooth and flexible is the experience. It is you who gives it life. It is your own life, very much so. As much as the sun is the sun, 
and the moon is your moon. So really we have to bring this like, ugh, this passion, this energy to life, to bring these sadness to life. Um, and so the last little bit I want to talk about, when Lama asked me to find vision, when I was feeling kind of low, down, flat, blah, I thought about it a lot, and I and I it just wasn't really happening for me. And what kept coming up for me was the word faith. Like, okay, if I was still in my Christian mentality and I believed in God, I just wanted God to reassure me that it was all going to be okay and that it was going to work and that it was all going to work out. And I was, you know, I was going to get there. I it feel felt to me like I just needed to trust. I needed a sense of faith or hope that something, somebody was, something was going to save me. The Buddhist path was going to work. I was going to find the vision. Or maybe there's a quality to it of that if I did the steps I was supposed to do, that it would work out, you know, and it wouldn't all be for naught. So I think there is an element of faith or hope to all of this, a belief in it. So I think the passion and the vision kind of have to go together. Like you can't just do it from an intellectual perspective. At least that's my experience with it. So how do we get the hope and the faith? You know, it's a sort of chicken and egg thing where they maybe feed one one another, but you have to start somewhere. You know, we talked in the beginning that the anatomy of hope, where I talked about the, the surgeries. Where does the hope come from? You know, we think about hope, and sometimes we think about it in sort of a, oh, it's all sunshine and lollipop sort of thing when you're hopeful. But really, I think hope and faith, they encompass a range of emotions. Sure, there's the energizing emotions, the awe and excitement. Um, and it, it does, when you're hopeful, it does encourage us to, to transcend ourselves. But vision also, it takes tweaking and refinement and working. So there is a little bit of one step forward, two steps forward, one step back, you know? And I think part of the aspect of hope and faith is um, that we have to have resilience for when things aren't going well, you know, when or the hurt or the upset or something, the resilience to go forward and the fear of the unknown or the fear that it's not working. And if we're unwilling to do that, then we just get sort of stuck in our solid ways. So I think the incrementalness is is important. And I think there's an authenticity to recognizing that it's a gradual process, that we don't just automatically become somebody that's on this path, has clear visions, has all this inspiration. And I remember one thing that struck me is there's this um, sense of guru devotion around Tantra. And as the Dalai Lama says, a lot of the, our inspiration comes from our guru. But this idea of guru devotion, it's if, if you don't talk about it and think about it a bit, it's almost like you're just supposed to naturally have this huge filled up sense of guru devotion. And I personally didn't go from zero to 60 on my guru devotion. And in fact, I was really pleased when I heard um, heard a, a, a bit of a talk or a writing from Sankapa that spoke to this. And so I wanted to just read you this little bit. Um, so let me read it, and I'll tell you why why I think it's important. Sankapa wrote a book, Essence of True Eloquence, which I think, if you get a good translation, it's a phenomenal book. If I had to be stuck on a desert island with one book, give me that one because it's so rich. But in the beginning of it, he's doing a praise to Manjagosha. So he's basically praising his teacher. And he's talking about all these things, his richness of his teaching, and our minds are all confused, and he's going the teacher helps us sort that out. But there's kind of a famous stanza in here, and the one that really caught me a couple weeks ago when I heard it. And it goes like this. It says, Yet when I stand before the Lord of death, and the stream of life is not quite ended, I will consider myself fortunate to have even this slightest faith in you. Yeah, so, I mean, this is Sankapa. This is the dude. You know, he's had all these amazing teachers and he appreciates them. But 
but what he's saying is that you know you have this much faith and i think and then there's some teachings around this where it's really not reasonable that we have infinite faith in our guru from the beginning because we don't know our teacher that well right we learn about our teacher our teacher teaches us something we go and experience it we get more faith we get another layer of our teacher and then we go and experience that so it's like getting to know your teacher and having the faith grow in you as you do you know and that people don't usually describe it that way at least they didn't to me and the whole point is that it's a gradual process and it's okay if we take a gradual approach to it and our progress is gradual and i think we have to be authentic with that and the more we're authentic with that the more we can open up to the practices ah i asked lama about this thing about faith well you know lama i mean i think i need faith what's up here and what's the relationship between faith and the vision he said faith gives us the energy One of the reasons I like the climber video is that Lama's all about mountains and summits and such. He said, you keep putting one foot in front of the other without stepping in a crevasse. And I think that's the faith. You just keep going. You know, you try to miss the crevasse, but you just keep going. He said, another analogy, vision is like seeing the path and the summit arising. But faith gives us the energy. It gives us the juice and intelligence, the juice, the energy, and the intelligence need to come together, he said. That we're naturally born with trusting energy, but with any seed, it needs to be watered. So you need both the faith and the vision to come together. So I think in reality, it's, it's about each of us finding our own vision and our own sources of faith and then putting, putting them together. So I thought it was kind of important to talk a little bit about the faith part of it. Um, so we've talked a little bit about vision just in normal life, secular from a secular perspective, high performance individuals, a little bit about the science behind um, faith, hope, visioning, and then how visualization is used in different ways in different parts of the path and how hope and faith tie into that. And I have one other little bit I wanted to read in closing, but I think it'd be a good time to just stop and have some discussion or see what confusion I arose for you or what questions you might have. Ah, Elizabeth. This is a great talk. I'm really enjoying it. It's just super. Thank you Thank so you. much. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I wanted to point out is sometimes the visual happens to you it happens so you wake up i had an experience where i had this the worst job ever and i've had terrible jobs but this was the worst job ever and um i was a genius at one point and then i was the worst person in the world the next week and it was a weird situation and I was aware that there was something in my person, my person, you know, how you have a circle around you that if somebody steps into it, it makes you uncomfortable. Well, I was aware that I had something there and I was in this sort of crisis. So I, it was, I looked down at it, it was sitting next to me. This is not an unusual thing. And I looked and I looked really hard with my, uh, like you described, you know, with your mind's eye. I looked at it with my mind's eye and it was a very old stone Buddha sitting there. And I was, in, I was surprised because usually I see other things and usually they don't come to me. And I was like, oh, gee, I guess it's an opportunity to do something else. What, what is this? What does this mean? And it really inspired me to, to look 
And it led me in a completely different direction. And I even looked it up on the internet because it was such a strong visual. I, I found it on the internet. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, it really led me out of that whole horrible job into a whole different place. So sometimes those visuals are sitting there already ready to lead you into your future. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm really enjoying your talk. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, I think it's a great comment and example of where if you're willing to be open and you know, it sounds like you were sort of exploring what's going on, then that came to you, you know, it's really fascinating. Anybody else? Karen. I was going to see if somebody else was going to say something first, but um, I want to thank you for your talk because I think when I'm thinking about myself, um, having been through the last several years, you know, kind of a lot of chronic pain, chronic illness, that I've not thought about what is my visualization for the future, because I'm, I'm like living one day at a time. And I'm and my whole thing is always keep going, keep going, keep going. That's what I keep. That's what I tell myself every day, keep going, keep going, keep going. And that does work. But I am not using a visualization of the future to, to help me, you know, you know, envision, I am not even thinking or indulging in the thought of what I might want it to be because I'm so busy stuck there going, keep going, Karen, keep going, you know? Um, so it's really inspiring to, to hear you say, you know, how to, that I, it's, it's uh, like gives me permission uh, to, to indulge in some sort of visualization of the future that's, positive and and then maybe uh, that I'll be able to live toward that and so that's really nice I, I really appreciate um, your talk because you reminded me of that that's a piece that that I've completely kind of left out <laughs> so thank you you're welcome and I can totally relate I remember there must have been a couple of darshans I went into Lama's office and I said I feel like I'm treading water you know it it's better than the alternative, you know, when you're in the middle of the lake and you stop treading, it's not so good, but you just feel like you're just like not getting anywhere. And so I can relate, Karen. And I think you're right. There's got to be something that pulls you to the shore, you know? Yeah. Andrew. Hey, Ellen. Hi, Andrew. Thank you for your talk. I always uh, get so much out of them. Uh, you know, I'm going to relate. Uh, largely to your talk, your comments on the placebo effect working in the medical setting as I do. Um, and it's interesting because I, I have a talk in the hopper for some day on chronic pain and um, the Dharma. And uh, just thinking about some of the people that I work with and how their, their lack of vision for themselves really does lead to things as, as extreme as, as uh, being in a wheelchair when they don't have to be. And so to me, I think I'm really gonna take, you know, that the power of the placebo effect is just uh, just truly astounding. Um, and if we can visualize um, our health on some levels, I mean, that's just, that tells you the power of visualization, like um, that we can transform our minds and our bodies. So um, I appreciate that I'm gonna be stalking you for some more information on that. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Well, one thing I think is interesting when we think about placebo effect, at least when I do, I always think about those other people. Oh, those other people that got fooled by the placebo. I mean, to turn the mirror and like, what am I getting fooled by, you know, or what am I limiting myself by that I could break out of? I'm just as bad as they are. I just don't see it, you know, so it is, I agree, incredibly powerful. Thank you. Thank you for that lot. Definitely. Thanks, Jack. Okay. Hi, Jack. <laughs>
more things to handle than the other. More raise his hand and put it down? Yeah. Okay. Well, you can get back on if you want. I just have one other thing I wanted to read from Stephen Levine. He he wrote a uh, he wrote a biography about Quan Lin called Becoming Quan Lin. And I just picked it because I just didn't want all the real heavy Buddha Dharma stuff all the time when I'm trying to go to sleep at night. Really a beautiful book. And uh, uh, Quan Lin, I guess, as a sort of a peasant, got sort of sucked, sold by her father into this monastery setting where she had to scrub the floors and stuff. And it was a very, she ended up becoming this amazing Buddha of compassion, essentially. But she herself is very poetic. So in this, in this sort of scene in the book, she's in a courtyard and she just has this stuff come out of her that she realizes. So this is Kuan Yin speaking in, through the story that Stephen Levine writes. It sounds the potential of the spirit and includes the joy of discovery of the quality of consciousness we call the heart. It can at first be more felt than heard. It spreads from the center of the chest and opens the body. Clarity and joy follow the surrender as the words that express our innate wisdom rise to the tongue and become audible. At the edge of our universe, where fear can harden the body and doubt can turn the heart to stone, we soften the belly so the song may arise. Letting go at the edge of who we imagine we are into what may be, we dissolve with a shudder and a sigh. The high ground from which we take the leap of faith. When the heart and mind are in harmony, they produce a song. It is life calling from cell to cell. It is a sense of our presence in the presence, a tributary to a boundless ocean. It is a love song, of course, which when sung changes everything. There's more to it all than can be seen from our shadowy corner. It's not always easy. It takes a moment and you never know when that moment might come. In the meantime, sing all the songs you can until you find your own. And when you do, let it vibrate the heart mind like a giant pipe organ in an ancient cathedral. Let it shake loose the mullions of even our most precious and colorful concepts. So thank you for letting me do the talk and for your attention. And I'll turn it over to somebody else for the closing prayers. Which we should do with all of our heart and soul. Dedication prayers. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. There's a good visualization. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, all powerful Chen Rezig, Tenzin Gyatso. Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manzushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losang Drapa, I make request at your holy feet. Thank you, Susan. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. Thank you, Ellen. Have a beautiful spring day. Okay. Thank you, Ellen. Thanks, You're Ellen. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Karen. Thank you, Ellen. That was fantastic. Bye, Morris. You're welcome. Thank you, Ellen. You're always so inspirational. Thank you. Oh, my goodness.
You're welcome. Thank you, Susan. Bye, Dana.